Our guest today is John Schulman. John is one of the co-founders of OpenAI and the lead architect of ChatGPT. Before leading the charge on ChatGPT, the world's most widely used large language model, John was one of the early pioneers of deep reinforcement learning. Having invented the widely used proximal policy optimization algorithm, also known as PPO, which is actually part of the ChatGPT training. He also invented Trust Region Policy Optimization, or a TRPO. He was a key contributor to OpenAI Gym, OpenAI Baselines, Stable Baselines, and to many of the modern deep learning era meta-learning algorithms. Before co-founding OpenAI, John was actually a PhD student in my lab at Berkeley, which is a time I still very much treasure. John, so great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Peter. So glad we get to catch up in, in this format here. Now, John, before diving into our conversation, um, I'd like to quickly thank our podcast sponsors, Index Ventures and Wits and Biases. Index Ventures is a venture capital firm that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs across all stages, from seed to IPO. With offices in San Francisco, New York, and London, the firm backs founders across a variety of verticals, including AI, SaaS, fintech, security, gaming, and consumer. On a personal note, Index is an investor in Covariant, and I couldn't recommend them any higher. Weights and Biases is an ML ops platform that helps you train better models faster with experiment tracking, model and dataset versioning, and model management. They are used by OpenAI, NVIDIA, and almost every lab releasing a large model. In fact, many if not all of my students at Berkeley and colleagues at Covariant are big users of weights and biases. John, you were at the center of the biggest AI release in recent history, many would say ever, the release of ChatGPT, which has made literally everyone talk about AI, in fact, talk with AI, just to make sure we're all level here. What is ChatGPT? ChatGPT is a chatbot uh, that's on a web app. You can visit it on chat.openai.com. It's um, it's a language model, so it's a model that generates text. Um, I think the the reason it really uh, took off is because even though there had been language models out there before, this one was uh, easy to use because you just talk to it like you would talk to a person, and it, it was above some threshold of smartness that uh, made it actually useful for a lot of uh tasks, like um, if someone is curious about some random knowledge topic or they want help writing, it's useful for a lot of that. I've played with it quite a bit, John, and I'm, I'm always impressed. Um, the other day, I asked it to, um, uh, I had to give a talk to a company, and I first asked it to uh, describe in one, one paragraph what the company is, and it described it. And then I asked it, um, can you now describe the company again? But uh, using Snoop Dogg rap style to describe it, and it just did it right there. And for sure, Snoop Dogg never did any raps about that company, and it just nailed it. It's, I mean, it, it's really mind blowing the way it can recompose things. How how is something like this even built? Yeah, so there are several uh, steps in the process of training this model. Um, so first of all, first you start with the pre-trained language model, and the way this this works is you take, uh, you just train the model to imitate um, a lot of human written text. So we have, um, so we want to basically train a model to use language like humans. And uh, to do that, you need to find a lot of text. And in practice, uh, what we do is we find lots of text on the internet and we train the model to produce text that looks like that. And in practice, what, what's going on is it's predicting next word given previous words. So you train on a lot of this and you've got your pre-trained language model, but now all it knows how to do is uh, generate random text from the internet. And some of this is the kind of um, behavior you want and some of it isn't. So then we need to fine tune it to have more consistent behavior and uh, professional behavior. So uh, so that's, that's where we do this uh, second fine tuning step. Um, and in particular, we do RL for human feedback. And in the pipeline there, we we have a few steps where first we do a little supervised learning where we train it on some very high quality responses written by humans 
we've hired and then we uh then we train um then then we actually do rl to improve it further um where we train a reward model that can recognize good responses and uh and then we do um rl with that reward model you're doing rl with the reward model meaning that the bot is effectively generating text and getting rated by the reward and tries to maximize that reward um is it possible that in principle just like in in alpha go let's say that you could generate a chatbot that is strictly superior at generating text than any human has ever been oh yeah definitely um i'd say i'd say the models are already super human in some ways and obviously not others so uh certainly well certainly if you count speed as a capability they're a lot faster than humans at writing poems and so forth or, or writing snoop dog uh like lyrics um so I, i'd say um i'd say overall um Models are never, it's not, there's not a single scalar that measures the smartness of the model. And they're su- superhuman in some ways, like the ability, like their vast breadth of knowledge and their ability to write, um, like in a very, uh, precise, like write in all these different styles, uh, and follow the, the patterns very well. Um, and then they're like worse than humans in a lot of other ways. In which ways do you think they're still not so good? Let's see. So, uh, certainly in, um, Certainly, there are a lot of tasks like mathematical reasoning where they're not uh, nearly as good as skilled humans. Um, let's say they're, uh, if you want them to do a long running task, uh, even if you prompt them very carefully uh, and tell them how to, um, you tell them what you want them to do and tell them they can take multiple steps, uh, they often uh, will get stuck in the middle and aren't very good at recovering. Now, to be fair, a lot of humans take a while too before they become good at math. In fact, some humans, you know, never truly uh, get to the top level of math. Most people don't get to the top level of the smartest humans in, in mathematics, right? Um, oh, yeah, so that's do you right. think there might be a there might be a path that this is just the beginning, but it could keep getting better at things like math? Oh yeah, I think um, the models are going to keep getting better. And it's even it's hard to describe exactly uh, what the what the limitations are um, or the fundamental limitations. So certainly they're Practic- there are limitations right now, like the models don't have a lot of the uh, actuators that we have. Like they can't, uh, th- they can just write out a bunch, write out text. They can't do anything. Um, but those are uh, very superficial limitations. So um, once you overcome those, it's it's not clear what the fundamental blockers are. Certainly, the I don't think the models are smart enough to um, to do like really high quality, um, like creative thought in math and the sciences. And uh, yeah, so I think that's a ways that's a a bit further off, but, um, it's not clear exactly how, how long that's going to take or how that's going to play out. Now, Sean, you mentioned that, um, language models have existed before, but chat GPT somehow exceeded its threshold of people just all of a sudden liking to interact with it, which wasn't as much the case with any of the previous models. Um, when you're working on ChatGPT and its predecessor, InstructGPT, bringing in the reinforcement learning component, did you think that was going to happen? Was that what you had in mind? Or was it just like, oh, let, this might be an improvement? And we'll, well, what was your thinking before it all took off? Well, I did think that there is a um th- that the chat um ui was uh a lot easier to use than what people had before so i, I thought there was a lot of potential there uh even uh, with a pretty minimal product that just um this would be an intuitive uh form factor um i yeah i, I definitely didn't uh, anticipate how uh, popular it would get i thought it would just be it would kind of have a niche appeal um, and you can use uh, the instruct GPT model to make a chat bot. Like if you just give it the right prompt, you can, you can make it, uh, tell it to behave like a chat bot and you'll get something decent. And it would have been, uh, at the time we released chat GPT, uh, you would have gotten something that was close to as good, not quite as good. Um, maybe, um, it, like we've, uh, 
like we train ChatGPT to be a little more self-aware and understand its limitations and um, to hallucinate less. Uh, whereas the um, the previous instruct models were more designed for continuing text and um, they, uh, so, well, doing writing tasks where uh, that kind of involved hallucination, um, where that's kind of a feature. Um, so, um, so I think I think it was a little better than what you could have created before, but um, not dramatically better. So, uh, so I was surprised that it blew up as much as it did. As has been blowing up and used so widely, are there any uses that you've seen of ChatGPT that kind of surprised you or got you excited? Um, just fun things that you you've seen people do. Well, I always I see that people are using it in lots of different ways to get value. I like their um, I mean, a lot of people who, uh, um, this is an obvious use case, but, uh, people who aren't native English speakers or need help writing in the right tone, uh, will use, will use it a lot, um, for, for just kind of, um, yeah, for writing help. Um, so that's an obvious use case for the, like e even the, the free, um, let's smart models, like not, you don't need GPT-4 for that, but, which is the more powerful model that you have to pay for. Um, let's see. So yeah, writing help is an obviously uh, obvious one. Um, I guess, uh, I see some, um, I see some creative use cases like people will, um, people will like use it to write bedtime stories for their kids or to have, uh, I don't know, uh, people will like just have fun with it. Uh, uh, I, actually I've, uh, yeah, you can use it to come up with uh, conversation starters. I've seen people, people do that. Um, I've gotten, uh, I've used it for travel advice and advice on like what kinds of, uh, what kind of, uh, activities to, to do fun activities. And I'm seeing my students use it all the time for their programming, uh, that they're doing. Um, even though that's not English text in the strict the sense of the of English, uh, it seems to be really good at programming also. Oh yeah, actually the programming use case is kind of the one that we we like I was using and and my colleagues were using. So that's kind of the one that we really dog fooded, and that that was a big uh, early motivator. Oh yeah, I'd say that uh, just seeing people uh, how much it helps uh, non experts do programming has been really, uh, really exciting. Like people, um, people who haven't really, um, studied programming, uh, but they can just, uh, prompt the model to write them a script. Um, and people have been, I've seen people do some very complicated things, even though they really, um, never, um, never formally learned programming and, uh, previously didn't think they were capable of it. That's that, that's so super exciting. I've seen it. You've alluded to, um, this notion of hallucinations a couple times, John, that chat TPT could have hallucinations. What are they? And do you have any thoughts on how to maybe avoid having such hallucinations in the model? Yeah. So hallucinations are just where the model starts making things up. Uh, and it, it outputs some, uh, plausible sounding text, which, uh, makes up facts or numbers or citations. And the reason you get this is, um, well, if we're allowed to, uh, sometimes it's easier to understand the model by saying it, it has, um, agency in some way. So if we're going to, so we could say that the model cares more about, uh, sounding like, um, pro like sounding right or sounding, um, like, uh, writing in, in the right style than actually being correct. And that's obviously true if you think about the maximum likelihood objective where you're just trying to output likely uh, words. Um, so in that objective, there is uh, maybe um, there is some small component where it's trying to output correct things, but uh, it's um, uh, there's a much stronger uh, tendency to just output something that like is in the right style or sounds like a... Uh, um, sounds like an answer so uh yeah so if you just um if you 
if you have a model that's not um that's kind of trained in a naive way it's going to hallucinate a lot and um uh with the uh the fine tuning we do with our also human feedback uh we we cut that down um uh, a large amount we still don't uh completely get rid of it so uh the models do hallucinate so our um our free tier model uh does um hallucinates a decent amount if you especially if you start asking it for citations and that sort of thing it'll just make something up um the uh better model based on gpd4 uh doesn't hallucinate nearly as much but it'll still occasionally uh do it especially if you um yeah if you ask if for uh certain kinds of specifics that it doesn't have and where it has hasn't been trained um to to be aware of this limitation you're saying it hasn't been trained to be aware of this limitation, which seems to suggest that there is a way to train it to be aware of that. How does that work? How do you make it aware of such limitations? We can sometimes uh, train the models to be aware of a specific limitation. So, uh, for example, like early versions of our models uh, had no idea what their capabilities were. So you would ask it, uh, can you send an email to so-and-so? And it would say, uh, yes, I just sent that email. Uh because that's kind of what a helpful, you might imagine a helpful chatbot would sound like. Um, so, so then we went and uh, just trained it like with this specific type of uh, query and uh, we trained it to say, no, I can't send emails. Uh, like, and so, um, so you can uh, kind of, it, you can do a, a sort of piecemeal process where you teach the model specific limitations that it doesn't have. And then the model will kind of generalize um, I'd say the models, um, and, and I would say GPD-4 does, um, since it's so, so, since it's a smart, very smart model, it does generalize quite well. So if you teach it a few things that it can't do, it'll, uh, infer lots of other things that it probably can't do. Uh, but it doesn't do this perfectly. Uh, so for, uh, for example, for something like, uh, citations, the model does actually, um, have a lot of, uh, knowledge about what's in specific uh, books and uh, famous papers and so on. So if you ask it for a citation, sometimes it actually gives you correct answers. I mean, it gives you um, correct ones. Um, so and that's rated as useful. So when we when we do our rating process, it, it, like obviously it's better for it to give the answer than to not give it. Um, so the model thinks it can somehow give cit cit sometimes give citations, which is correct. Uh, but it doesn't quite uh, have a good uh, internal feeling of um, uh, how confident it is about these citations. So um, sometimes it'll sometimes it'll just make them up, uh, and I guess it doesn't. It probably doesn't know that it made them up, or or it actually might know that. So sometimes you can ask it, uh, "Are you sure about that?" And it'll say, uh, "No, sorry, I made that up." Um, so. Yeah, I guess we don't totally understand the general how all these uh, abilities generalize and how the like uh, like teaching about the limitations uh, generalizes. So, so that's definitely an interesting topic for further research. When you talk about bringing in citations, it seems like an alternative instead of having the model ahead of time read the entire internet, so to say, and then try to still answer with citations is to let it retrieve things on the fly. Uh, what are your thoughts on the trade-offs between models that use retrieval versus models that have everything trained into their weights? Yeah, I think there's a place for both approaches, and and we're doing that right now. So we have um, in ChatGPT we have a browsing model, which is um, actually not. Uh, we recently had to uh, temporarily take it down, but it'll be back. Uh, so we have a model that can look things up on the web, um, but uh, the default model doesn't. Um, I think a mo models can store a huge amount of information in their weights and e including very detailed factual knowledge. And, uh, if you have information in the weights, um, the model can, can use it in a very flexible way. So it can make connections between things. Or if you ask a question about something that's vaguely related, it might, uh, it might make a connection that would be hard to like, it would be hard to make that connection with a search query. Uh, by, by issuing the search query that would make this uh, connection. So so I think having information in the weights is ultimately uh, going to lead to smarter and more flexible behavior, but um, 
there, oh yeah, there are a couple of big advantages to also being able to do retrieval. Uh, so first of all, like real time, you have access to real time information. You have access to um, more detail than what you'd be able to cram into the weight. Um, and last of all, it's also more checkable by a human. Uh, so I think it's um, it's extremely important for uh, liable like to make these uh, model outputs checkable, uh, both as part of the training process and as part of the um, like test time use cases. Because uh, at training time, like if like humans are when we have um, humans uh, looking at the outputs and rating them, uh, like the models have such a big breadth of knowledge that uh, the people doing the rating might not know enough about the subject to really uh, assess the answer. So if the model can cite, uh, can provide citations, like that makes it a lot easier to get to do accurate supervision. So, so, so that's really important. But then also as an end user, um, being able to check with the language model uh, output, it is extremely useful for obvious reasons because they do sometimes hallucinate. So uh, if you can just uh, make its output verifiable, that's obviously, um, that's going to be useful, especially if it's a high stakes setting, like uh, say medicine. Fully really agree, John. Now, in terms of the technology underneath, it, as I understand it, a lot of the large language model training regime does single epoch training, meaning that you just go through your training data once, not multiple times. Isn't it then surprising that it can remember those specific things from just one pass? Do you have any intuition how in one pass over the data it has gotten just one gradient step on that one specific citation and it somehow stores it? Um, seems seems surprising to me. I'm not saying it's not true. It's, I'm just very surprised by it. Uh, yeah, it is uh, surprising how well these uh, language models absorb information from the source, uh, from uh, the pre-training data. Um, I'd say that um, any given fact will appear in many different documents on the internet. And if it's only in one document, uh, the model probably won't uh, be able to recall it, or at least uh, current models. So, uh, but it's an interesting question, how many times the model has to see the fact to really uh, to really internalize it. And I would guess that's uh, somewhere in the tens, but it's hard to say for sure. Talk about internet and data. Uh, obviously, these models are trained on a lot of data. And recently, your colleague, Sam Altman, uh, mentioned that we might be running out of gas as a community in terms of as we keep scaling these models, um, they might not keep getting better. Um, not enough opportunity ahead in terms of data and model scaling. What do you think about that? Definitely the existing... Um methods of uh, data and model scaling might uh, peter out after a while, or at least um, the improvements might be, say, logarithmic in, uh, in uh, the data set and um, data set sizes and training uh, training compute. So, uh, so you, you're sort of hitting diminishing returns. Uh, but I'd say there's plenty more to do and uh, I don't see a. Um, I don't see things uh, plateauing anytime soon. One of the things that um, is happening right now in the field is that there's, of course, many competitor models being released too. It's it's not just ChatGPT. There's many others, including many open source ones. I'm curious what you think is the role of closed source versus open source releases. Um, are they both important? Is one right versus wrong? W what is your thinking? Yeah, um, and in fact, the uh, Llama two is released today, so that's a timely question. Um, well, I think the open source models are certainly really good for research, like for um, say academic researchers to be able to do experiments where they're fine tuning the models and um, making architecture changes and so on. Um, so, and try to do the kind of uh, the kind of work we're doing at OpenAI, like. Uh, trying to improve RL from human feedback. So having a really strong open source model makes that possible. So I think that's really valuable. Um, I think for, um, uh, I mean, the closed source models are currently um, currently better, or at least the best models that are out there are better. And I think um, it would be hard to incentivize uh, models uh, to get really good without um, there being some like, uh, 
some commercial, uh, well, w- without it being um, like a, a closed model that, uh, yeah, for obvious reasons. Uh, so I think, yeah, I would expect to see the closed models, uh, like the 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 best models uh, to be closed models. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the the open ones are really good for research, and I expect them to also be good for a lot of uh, commercial uses as well, uh, where people figure out how to fine tune them on their uh, specific data or fine tune them in some uh, some way that's not currently enabled by the uh, AP, by the uh, existing commercial providers. Is that maybe? I mean, are you tying it back effectively to the resources required to have the high quality data? and the high amounts of compute and that it might be very hard to get access to those resources if you're going to build an open source. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, like it's hard to, um, yeah, incentivize, uh, putting that, uh, like, uh, making that big of an investment in an open source model that you can't make money off of. So I, 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 yeah, so I wouldn't expect to see the state of the art models be open source, but, uh, I think they do have, uh, they do like uh, create create value, yeah. For they create a public good of sorts. I mean, they might also uh, like yeah. There's also some uh, safety concern, or there's some concerns that they might also create a public bad. Uh, like if people are using these models to do spam, uh, to do like super large scale spam that wouldn't be allowed by API providers. So I think I think that's going to be a problem at some point, and then. Uh, maybe the companies like Meta who are producing open source models will have to think twice about it, but uh, we'll see how that plays out. When you think about large language models today, John, um, they, they obviously have all kinds of capabilities already. They have some some limitations also. Do you see the future of getting to the next level as doing more of the same? In some sense, like keep curating text data with you know human feedback or do you think something else need to be brought in just to put something out there imagine the model um maybe has access to videos to watch videos to better understand what the physical world is like or maybe it has access to a simulator and can try out you know what the physical world world feels like in some sense or could those things take it to the next level or does that seem not not so relevant uh, compared to just pumping in more data of, of the current type. Oh yeah. I think adding new capability, new, um, modalities, like, uh, the ability to perceive video, uh, is going to add a lot. Um, so if we are in uh, some regime where, uh, we're getting diminishing returns from, uh, scaling up the existing data, uh, like adding a new modality just, um, allows the model to well, it allows it to access a lot of knowledge that it wouldn't get in text form and also to potentially um, be able to act in ways that the pure language model wouldn't. Uh, so for example, well, you can watch, uh, I mean, anything that involves interacting with the physical world uh, is going to benefit a lot from perceiving video. And well, actually even uh, interacting with computer screens, just because uh, all software is designed for humans. So uh if you um, like, if you can just uh, uh, view view the pixels and and uh, perceive the video, then you can use all sorts of um, existing software or help people use that software. So I think just uh, giving the model new uh, the ability to um, like uh, to have new new affordances and interact with new new things is going to add a lot to their effective uh, capabilities. Um, yeah, I think there's also a lot more. Um, in the pure language model world, um, beyond scaling up the existing stuff. So, I mean, I, uh, I still think we have a long way to go in, uh, fine tuning the models in a smarter way. And, uh, like, like I think the exist, the, uh, RL for human feedback pipeline has, uh, a lot of room for improvement. Um, in particular, um, I'd say a big area is, uh, using the models to help uh, grade themselves instead of just uh, like training this reward model on human data. Now that reminds me of things like GANs where, you know, one model is trained the other model to generate more realistic tasks, text on, in this case, but it would be images in the original GAN scenario and start sounding very similar to that. Going to the, the fine tuning, John, it has been 
talk that the fine tuning stage might reduce the generalization ability and the breadth of knowledge the model is still able to expose. How would that, do you even think that's true? And if so, how, how would that happen? It's definitely true that when you fine tune the models, you reduce the variety of um, styles and types of content they're going to output. And uh, we definitely um, do get what's uh, called mode collapse or entropy collapse, where in some cases the um, the model will output a very um, like a narrow set of answers or a single answer. So if you ask the model, uh, tell me a joke, or if you ask ChatGPT, tell me a joke, it'll probably it'll always tell you the same joke. I think it oscillates exact um, exactly which joke it tells oscillates a bit. Like uh, there is one like uh, why do, why don't scientists trust atoms because they make up everything? Uh, so there's like. <laughs> There's some uh, like silly jokes like that that the model uh, latches onto. So anyway, uh, you definitely um, get this kind of mode collapse effect. Um, as for, um, I think there's also probably some uh, degradation of the model's capabilities when you do fine tuning. Um, just because um, when you do pre-training, it's um, with uh, much bigger batches and uh, you're really um, making sure to um, like preserve all of the like all the capabilities on this huge uh, variety of uh, of um, types of input. So, uh, and then when you fine tune the models, uh, you're only uh, seeing you have a much smaller data set. Uh, so it's possible that um, like you're losing some capabilities that weren't represented in your fine tuning data sets and. And you're also uh, like, there's just more noise in the fine tuning process. So you just degrade the uh, the model a little bit due to that noise. So I think there's a little bit of that. I think uh, like we, we run uh, various benchmarks on on the models and compare to the pre-trained base models and uh, try to make sure the abilities don't degrade too much. And I'm uh, pretty sure they don't. Uh, in the latest recipes, we they're not degrading that much, um, but yeah. I want to talk more about um, your trajectory uh, soon, but where we're currently at, the large language models dominate the conversation because they've had the biggest leap forward or multiple big leap forwards compared to any other domain. It's I mean, pretty much what everybody's talking about because of the big change in capabilities. Do you see anything else on the horizon where you say, well, maybe that or that area in AI could see a similarly big leap forward in the future? What would it be? Um, I don't have a, uh, like a specific area that I think is going to really take off. I think the language model, um, like the language models are going to serve as a core that a lot of things are built, uh, built on top of. Uh, so I think, um, I think probably other modalities will be built on top of uh, language models. Like you'll have, um, you'll take the big language models and you'll add uh, like um, like vision and video and so on, and uh, and then maybe do things. Then maybe uh, because um, I think uh, language, the, like a big advantage of language is it's very information dense, and so it's. Uh, um, and it's like very, uh, it doesn't have as much noise as other, uh, types of data like video. So, um, so I think it's, um, for a long time, the language is going to be a good way to soak up a lot of intelligence, um, with a, um, limited amount of compute, but then, uh, I, I like there's transfer between language and other, um, other modalities. So I think, I think you're going to see people, uh, having language plus video and so on. And, uh, so maybe even something uh, like, um, I mean, so, so for robotics, uh, I would predict that actually, uh, like robotics will eventually for robotics, people will be using some kind of multimodal model that uh, is joint trained with language and like video and control. Uh, so I think that kind of thing, I think that's that's got to be in the future of AI. Um, I'd say there are also areas uh, that are um, like totally orthogonal to what kind of model you're training that are gonna uh, that are gonna rise in prominence. So uh, I, I'd say this um, 
this idea of scalable super scalable oversight or uh, improving supervision quality is going to become more important. So, uh, so the idea here is that um, uh, how can you use how can you uh, collect data in uh, hard domains where it's even hard to get humans to produce high quality uh, labels or high quality demonstrations. So how do we use model plus human together uh, to um, create higher quality data than a human would be able to create and supervise models in domains that um, are are really hard? So I think this is an interesting, this is an important problem and probably it, it'll become more popular in the ML uh, research world. The example that comes to my mind is then an AI that would do scientific research effectively, that would yeah. go maybe read biological data that humans don't really know how to read, like protein sequences, RNA, DNA sequences, and then look at experimental results and somehow combine it into new hypotheses or conclusions even that are very hard to, to come up with for humans. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I think that's a really exciting one. And uh, there might be some fields like biology that are just too uh, complicated for humans. And uh, maybe, um, yeah, maybe if we, uh, I mean, since AIs um, just, uh, even if they're not smarter than humans, they can certainly do more work faster. So, uh, so it could be that we can have them sift through a lot of uh, a lot of complicated data from biology and figure something out. I look forward to seeing that happen. Maybe, maybe we'll both be working on it in the future. Who knows? Um, now, one thing that stood out to me as I look at your career trajectory, John, is how you've moved across topics. Right, you started in my lab and imitation learning, robotics, then concluded reinforcement learning would be key to make more progress. Then from there, of course, spent a lot of time on reinforcement at OpenAI and brought it into language models. I'm really curious about that trajectory. Um, let's maybe start with the latest and work our way back into the, into the past. When did you decide to start paying attention to language models and why? I'd say around uh, GPD-2, uh, um, it started be to become clear that uh, these things were really good and uh, worth paying attention to. So I didn't actually switch over to working on language models at, at that point. Um, actually, uh, my conclusion at that point was that uh, like uh, unsupervised learning kind of works now that and that uh, training a generative model is a really good way to uh, um, like create a general like, like a model with general purpose capabilities that can be fine-tuned for a downstream task. Because at the time, I had been really interested in sample efficiency and reinforcement learning. So that's like how fast the model can uh, learn a new task. And that's um, that's in some ways the core problem in reinforcement learning. And maybe even you could say it's the core one of the core problems in AI. Um, so, so I was really interested in sample efficiency and uh, GPT-2 came out um, and... Uh, like uh, GPT-2 could do a lot of things like uh, few shot, meaning you give the model a few examples and it figures it out in context. But there were also a lot of good results with fine tuning it uh, to do different tasks, like solve all these natural language benchmarks. So anyway, I thought that at the time, I thought that uh, uh, maybe we should train uh, like uh, for RL, for, for uh, domains like uh, like playing games and for robotics, maybe we should uh, like train video models and then fine tune them uh, on RL tasks. So I worked on that a bit, and and that kind of worked, uh, but it 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 didn't didn't end up working well enough to get really excited about. Um, but then around uh, GPT three, uh, I was um, even more uh, blown away by uh, how good GPT three was, and um, then I decided it made sense to. Uh, pivot uh, uh, my work and my team's work to uh, do an RL on language models. Um, so we weren't actually the first ones at OpenAI to do RL on language models, um, but uh, we decided uh, as the RL team, it made sense for us to go in this direction. Uh, so at that time, we started working on uh, 
uh, like, well, we had two projects. One was around math, solving math problems, and the other was around uh, incorporating retrieval and web browsing uh, and using RL to learn how to use those tools better. So, so that's how I got it. So I got into language models. Uh, I don't remember the exact timeline. That must have been like, uh, when was this? Was um, was this 2020 or, or uh, yeah, I don't remember the timeline, but uh, yeah, probably uh, this is probably like early, uh, late 2019 or early, tw- yeah, this is probably mid 2019. Now, you made a transition before during your PhD, you transitioned from being really focused on imitation learning, getting really good results, teaching robots from demonstrations to then deciding that reinforcement learning would be key to make progress on. Why did you make that transition at the time? Because I think for many researchers, the big question is, are you working on the right thing, right? And especially if you've already invested a bunch of time on one topic, making the decision to transition into a neighboring but new topic is kind of a high cost decision because you'll probably slow down for a while in your output before you start doing, you know, the same, you reach the same kind of productivity in the new area. So I'm curious about your thought process back then also, even as a PhD student that you already like dared to switch topics in some sense. Yeah, I'd say the switch from working on robotics to working on RL was the biggest uh, switch that I made, except perhaps uh, going into machine learning in the first place. Uh, but I'd say, um, I'd say that was a big shift because as you remember, uh, I was just playing with uh, toy examples for a long time. For I was playing with like a cart pole and that kind of thing for like six months. Uh, but uh, so, so that, um, that involved a big leap of faith. I'd say the ones that I've done after that have felt a little smoother and more of a continuous transition, like uh, um, switching from uh, doing RL on this domain to doing RL on this other domain or um, uh, like focusing on one problem to another problem. So yeah, yeah, it's always felt uh, pretty natural to do these transitions. Um, but I, th- I think, uh, yeah, I think it was good to, uh, well, it, it turned out to, to be, luck- well, either prescient or lucky to switch to RL at, at the time that I did it. This year, I mean, you did some of the first work in combining deep learning with reinforcement learning, at least in the, in the modern era where deep learning really started to work. Which, which is still the work a lot of people build on and use today, including, of course, proximal policy optimization, which is probably the most widely used reinforced learning algorithm uh, still today. Um, I'm kind of curious, as you, as you think back, I mean, it's been a while since you were in your PhD, John, right? It's been seven, seven years by now, probably. But you must remember PhD days, and especially there's the thing that's on a lot of PhD students' minds today, which is um, industry especially OpenAI in particular, has a tremendous budget, very large budget, right? The latest investment from Microsoft is a $10 billion investment, which is uh, seemingly largely going to compute and maybe data curation and so forth. That kind of budget is obviously not available in PhD programs, right? And so it seems like some opportunities to make progress in AI exist at OpenAI, but might not exist in PhD programs. Are there still, like from your perspective, being at OpenAI, do you, do you see opportunities to do things that don't require the massive compute and our data budget that are also very exciting? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I see papers from academia that I like occasionally, so it's definitely possible. Um, I'd, say, uh, I'd say you kind of... Um, yeah, it's a little tricky. You need to figure out some uh, some kind of niche where it's not um, you're not going to get um, get scooped by industry, or, or you're not going, or actually your work isn't going to be just kind of uh, like obsoleted by uh, some model that gets released. Um, so yeah, you got to think about that. But um, I think there are plenty of such topics available. Um, whether you're doing um, like. Uh, whether you're doing some uh, interesting kind of fine tuning or some kind of scientific investigation to understand understand these models and how they generalize or how to how to collect to um, supervise them better, 
I'd say there's a lot of opportunity for doing high quality uh, scientific work, like trying to really dig in and understand things. Uh, whereas um, at an in industry lab, there might be um, more of a focus on uh, like on results and on like um, and just like creating uh, better products. Um, yeah, I, I think there's uh, there's a lot of opportunity to like do things really uh, precisely, be curious and and uh, try to understand things uh, as as a PhD student. Are there things that you know? Examples of things that you would personally be excited about if you had the time to spare, but you know, I guess you're you know already so busy. But they say, "Wow, these are problems that if I were a PhD student today, I might take on." Or is there maybe a process how you would identify such problems? Yeah, let's see. I don't have a list uh, prepared, uh, so maybe I'd go for the process. Yeah, we can talk about the process instead. Well, I'd probably just think about uh, what. Okay, so first of all, what um, like what are some uh, abilities that uh, I think w would be exciting for models to have, which uh, where there's um, it's not totally clear how to get there. What would be what are some limitations in how we currently train models? Maybe it doesn't have to be a new capability, like you want the model to uh, do surgery or something, but uh, you it's like uh, you you want the model like it seems bad that we do things this way. Like it seems bad that we, uh, uh, we don't understand, um, like, uh, where, where in the data set models capabilities are coming from. So I think this is actually, this is one like interesting area. It's like, uh, like attribution of, uh, model behavior to the data set. Um, so, so there's been some, some interesting recent work on this, but I, I think like the fact that we, um, we, uh, we pre-train the models and then fine-tune them on these different soups of data, and uh, we get something out at the end, and we're not sure uh, where all of its behaviors came from. That seems bad. So, so you you might uh, have this idea, and then then go back and say, uh, okay, how can we fix that? Um, and then, uh, yeah, then just go from there. Um, so, yeah, I would um, maybe there's a combination of uh, thinking about like. Um, future uh, capabilities of interest or thinking about uh, like weaknesses of um, like current um, current methods and just trying to trying to fix them and then avoiding things that seem like they're on track to being uh, solved uh, without your help. If we look back at the origins of deep learning um, with Jeff Hinton, Yosha Bencho, Jan LeCun working on it for, for many years before it really came to fruition, of course, with, with many collaborators. Do you think it's possible that um, we're in a local optimum now again? Back then, nobody was working on deep learning except for a few people, and then it broke through. Now everybody's working on these large models, trained on large data sets. Like, just to, to say something contrarian, is the future maybe you know, tiny data sets? Pro probably not super tiny, but is it possible that there is something else that is yet to be discovered that's yet quite different from what we're doing today. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, possible and uh, quite likely, in fact. Yeah, and uh, who, know, who knows? Like, uh, it could be that um, uh, we can get a lot further with tiny data sets. Um, I think, uh, I mean, humans uh, learn from, not from tiny amounts of data. We have high bandwidth of data coming in through our eyes, but uh, like the amount of data that, I mean, I mean, a, a baby sees uh, undiverse data compared to our pre-training data sets. Like they're mostly in one house. Uh, so uh, the fact that you can learn a really good visual system from that is pretty amazing. So I think there's there's a lot that uh, still has yet to be discovered. Um, and yeah, I'd say it's probably the uh, it's probably the case that they're new, uh, like new architectures and loss functions uh, that are better than what we have right now. Um, like, like there's a temptation to keep pushing on what, uh, what's working and it keeps scaling. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I think there's uh, there still might be uh, a lot out there that we haven't discovered yet. And we, we might be in certain kinds of local optima, but it's hard to predict even where the, uh, where the, uh, the big breakthroughs might be. Yeah, I guess it's uh, when we talk about Jeff and Joshua and Jan, might be some survivorship bias there. <laughs> it's the 
the three people yeah. who worked on the right thing that succeeded might be many people who worked on all kinds of other obscure things at the time that that never saw uh their their you know time in the in the light where they they get recognized for something important they ended up doing um so it's hard now some people even will argue that today it's it's hard um I, I wouldn't personally fully agree, but that's saying it's hard to do to to do a PhD and do as interesting work in academia as you can do in industry. If you can right away go to industry, you can right away have access to the bigger resources and so forth and, and run bigger experiments, have, at least have more visible results for sure. What were you personally do? Let's let's say you personally graduated from your, you know, you did your undergrad at Caltech before you came to Berkeley for your PhD. If you graduated from Caltech undergrad today, do you think you 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 would explore a PhD or do you think you would try to find a way to jump right into an industrial research lab? Uh, either doing a PhD program or a residency program could be a good start. And uh, I'd say they have their pros and cons. Like a PhD uh, is a longer endeavor. So, uh, but that means you can really become the world expert in something. So, uh yeah, and, and as a PhD student, you can do internships and so forth. So I think that's not a bad a bad option. Um, as if you go into a residency program, it's uh, like it's going to be a little bit. Um, you'll probably have a little bit less freedom, and it's uh, you have less of a runway to just explore different things. So maybe there's a bit of a exploration exploitation trade off there. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure uh, what I would do. Um, I think both of those would be good options. I'm going to ask you another uh, research advice question, John, because, I mean, to me, you still stand out as clearly one of the, arguably the most successful uh, PhD student to emerge fr from my lab. And um, people, people, many new students will ask, well, you know, how, how did John go about his research? How, how, you know, literally one of my students asked me, you know, how can it be like John just a few weeks ago that was that was the actual question of like, and I'm like, how am I gonna, how do I even tell them how to be like John? I need to ask you the question, you know, what what is kind of the approach to research, let's say as a PhD student that you followed and would follow today? What 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 does a your schedule look like? What does your trajectory look like in the program? How do you go about it? Uh, well, I was in the right uh, place at the right time, so it's. Uh, like hard to replicate the uh, exact uh, initial conditions, um, even if I were to redo it myself. I definitely um, like read up on um, if I was working on an area, I'd read up read up on it pretty thoroughly. Like uh, read the papers in that area. Um, I also read a lot of fundamental stuff, like uh, like some textbooks on optimization and information theory and stuff. Um, I'd say in terms of the actual problems, I kind of. Uh, first couple of years, I, uh, just, uh, kind of went with, um, uh, what else, what was going on in the lab and what, uh, like, like you had sort of, uh, created some, uh, like major thrust for the lab, like around, uh, personal robotics and surgical robotics. So I was just kind of, uh, goal oriented on those projects and just trying to figure out what was, um, like, um, let's try to do something cool in one of those areas and, uh. Yeah, let's try to do something cool, but let's not just hack it. Let's uh, try to also have some like methods that seem reasonably general. So, so I tried to make um, I I tried to um, kind of make a a natural or, or some kind of reasonable compromise there, because um, I do think it's good to have um, motivating problems, but then also like those problems aren't necessarily the ones that uh, you're not building a product uh, anyway. Like, like at the end of the day, you're probably not building a useful product. So it's like, you just want those to motivate a good method. So yeah, first couple of years, I just, uh, worked on things that I just tried to do, like achieve cool things in those, uh, those domains. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, then I started, uh, then I guess, um, the like deep learning started to take off. And I, so I had a little bit of a, Maybe it had like a mid midlife crisis, uh, mid PhD crisis, and just uh, was thinking, oh yeah, uh, everything I'm doing in robotics seems a bit hacky, and I'm not sure this stuff is gonna um, like uh, work in the like 
be the winning approach in the long run. So, so then I started exploring a little bit more and uh, decided to go into work on deep RL. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a kind of natural progression where you start off with doing some like goal oriented work that's uh, where you're not, you're kind of agnostic about the methods. And then after you've done that for a while, you kind of, you have a sense of uh, what are the uh, limitations of the current paradigm. And then maybe you get you, uh, that gives you a, a good, like good ideas for the next paradigm or for what to do, like, for more methods oriented research. Thanks for sharing that, John. Hopefully it can help uh, a lot of people in, in their PhD progression or residency programs and, and so forth. Um, John, obviously I, I know you as somebody who works a lot, <laughs> thinks very deeply, spends a lot of time thinking about AI. Um, do you ever have time to, to relax and what do you do? Yeah, I may work a lot, but I'm also sometimes a lazy person and, uh, <laughs> and I have to <laughs> struggle to, uh, get things done but um yeah I re- uh let's see i've been getting um into rock climbing lately so uh i mean still working my way out but uh that's been it's been fun um yeah I, I go running uh i've done that for a long time just uh kind of just go run around the neighborhood and listen to music um i have uh i have chickens um so uh in my backyard so, uh, they're, they're fun. They, so it's like, take care of them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I like music, uh, play the piano. Uh, I, I just went on vacation, uh, to Italy. So, um, sounds nice. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was fun. So, Hey John, this was just a fantastic conversation. Uh, I really appreciate you making the time. Uh, thanks for joining. Oh yeah. Thanks for having me. This is great.